No, I'm not surprised. I mean, we we've been having flavor. It's about time we got our juice. It's about time we yeah. got at us. And it's not just hip hop. It's not just R and B. It's pop. It's rock. It's reggae music. It's everything. Mm. Toronto. It's the multicultural. It's a fusion. It doesn't even have to be a fusion of music. It's just there's a vibe here. Just like there's a vibe in New York. It's a different vibe, but yeah. it's a vibe, you know. So when we we work it out. And if you can either love it or you don't love it. You know, sometimes I love it, sometimes I hate it. That's why I don't stay all the time. And then when right. I leave, I miss it. <laughs> Welcome back to a brand new episode of Inner Sleeve, the podcast taking a behind the scenes look at all things music. I'm Cassius Morris, Joe Pacheco joining me on the line. What's happening, Joe? Very sad, my friend. Very sad. We're getting closer and closer to the end of summer, man. What's going Uh, on? (laughs) Now I'm sad. Don't remind me. You're going to see the singular tear come rolling down my face. Uh, These are the facts, folks. Here in Canada, we got to count our sunny days, our days of sunshine and enjoy them. I know as far as my end of like, I think we've had like, I think I can count on a hand on my, on, like on a hand, like how many actual rain days we had, like maybe six tops all summer. Like it's been really good. It wasn't too bad here as well in the Western part of the country. We, uh, we had a couple of days we were rained out, but otherwise it's okay. So we're, we're, we're still firing up the end of festival season over here and we hope yep. you guys are enjoying the rest of your summer as well. Wherever you're tuned into the sound mojo family, all around the world. By the way, we're racing up to 28,000 subscribers. So just a quick thank you to all you guys. It's going to be 30K before we know it, Joe. Yeah, man. Like this was a a nice run, the last uh, last thousand from 27 to almost 28. Uh, So yeah, it's been great. Like it's been great just watching it every day, slowly just go up, 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 up. And all the hard work we put into it seems to sort of like, you know, all right, all right. feels good, you know? Definitely make sure to keep checking in on all of our pages and hit that subscribe and follow as well. Hopping into some news in the world of music, the Prince of Darkness himself (laughs) is back. That's right, the Ozman Cometh, Ozzy Osbourne, has officially made his return to the stage and to the scene in general after a major life-altering surgery and a life-altering fall. Now, this has not been an easy season for Ozzy, as we know, Joe. But it yeah. looks like the prince himself is back, and we do have a little <laughs> update from the man himself, actually. Yeah, we'll share this clip here on Entertainment Tonight. But like, yeah, it was just, we hadn't heard. We had spoken about him a couple episodes ago, and we're like wondering whatever happened after that surgery. And then he's everywhere. <laughs> That's he's the amazing everywhere thing. now. The Ozman <laughs> cometh again. You know, like it is insane. I, Let's hear him. Ozzy, I just came in from outside and there's a 25 foot blow up of you, dude, and it made my day. How does it feel to make your Comic Con debut? It's great. It's great. I like to see people, you know. That's been been the hardest thing over the past three years because I've been trying to recover from my surgery. I'm getting there, and and it's a slow climb back, you know. You look good, man. You look good. The recovery's going well, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. So it was great to see him at Comic-Con above, you know, nonetheless, I mean to say, you know. The giant Aussie blow up as well that the guy mentioned here from E.T. made a tour across the country, folks, in almost all 50 states. So if you're in America, you may have seen a giant Aussie inflatable outside of the Las Vegas sign, perhaps somewhere in Manhattan. And, uh, you know, I love to see this, Joe, because... After we found out the news that Ozzy was having his life-altering surgery, I really and truly was not sure if we would see this legend come back to the stage again. It pains me to say it, but that was my initial gut feeling. I don't know about you. Yeah, well, for me, it's weird. Like, I was uh, touched a bit by your reaction in the sense of you're, you're like, wow, I don't know what's happening. For me, I sort of take it for granted. Like, he's always been around Ozzy. You know, and I guess I'll be shocked just like everybody else will when he isn't around anymore. But it was nice to see that how much you really care about him and like, well, man, I really hope he comes back. And then like, you know, as soon as the story came up, we're like, yeah, we're talking Aussie today, you know, so it's, it's touching, you know, it's nice. It's amazing to see, you know, and, and that's the thing, you know, the thinking about the fact that someone in my generation and even, you know, my generation is starting to have kids now. The fact that they mm-hmm. could bring their kids to see Aussie, I mean, it is It's incredible to think about the generations that this has spanned across. Now, this isn't only an appearance at Comic-Con, though, folks. As well as this appearance, we also were treated to the first official return of Ozzy to the stage since his Mm -hmm. surgery. And now, 
This is an interesting one, folks, because not only was this Ozzy Osbourne, we got half of the Ozzy Osbourne band, or I guess one third of it, and half of the Black Sabbath band. So we had Tony Iommi, Ozzy Osbourne, and who else joined him on stage here, Joe? We had Tommy Clufados. Yeah, and Adam Blake, I think it says it here when we play it. We'll just see what they sound like, because this is... Yes. You know interesting to see like i'm ready like we from not knowing where how the guy was doing to he's being on stage <laughs> he's playing we'll cut it down here but like what's like i'm actually so fed up of hearing this song paranoid is like right back to because like every time you want to you know as a, in high school you're jamming with a new band or new friends it's always paranoid or iron man like i'm so tired of those riffs but like hearing it like this I love it you know hearing them playing it hearing the way it sounds and it sounds fantastic man he sounds great I think Oz really sounds like he's turned a corner here, you know, and again, there's been speculation about how many, you know, how much of it is authentic, how many tracks are being played. At this point, I would say that, look, I'm happy to get whatever we can get from the guy. If he's, if it makes him happy to be on stage, whether he needs some assistance or not, I think he's earned that right. And, you know, at the end of the performance, um, I did see a little highlight on social media. He was saying, you know, long live Birmingham. And, you know, so this is a homecoming show for Ozzy as well, which I think sure. adds, to, adds to the level of importance to this. Yeah, and like I mean, I I couldn't tell if there's there's no backing tracks that I can tell from what I heard. You know, like it sounded sounds pretty great. legit. Honestly, sounds live, sounds great. And the, you know, keep in mind that today, most of these shows, especially at this budget level, you know, they have like uh, all the digital boards with all the plugins. That same plugins yeah. they use in the studio. And obviously, this is paranoid. Didn't have plugins back in the day. But I'm just saying, like, the mix is more and more and more are are sounding better because like they're able to save the setup and it's you know, from town to town you just need to tweak and adjust for the venue you know so it's like that's why the shows are sounding so much so much more like albums are much better you know so maybe people in this case are thinking there's backing tracks obviously we know there's mm. other people that play with backing tracks we know that that's true and hey man you know like i'm, I'm on the, always been on the fence like i want to enjoy the band i want to see them perform live so I'm, I appreciate when I go see like a band like Dream Theater or a band like this, you know, that they care about playing almost like the album kind of thing, you know, so I can appreciate that. But I also don't want to go to a show where the album was like, let's say like Def Leppard, you know, like, you know, and even them, like they 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 have their five part harmonies, they all do their harmonies. But like, yeah, you know, there's certain shows where I want to enjoy the song as well and not just be like, oh, this is missing. This is missing or they can't hit those notes. So it, I'm, I don't know if I'm for or against backing tracks. I think it just depends hmm. on the show itself, you know? I think that's a good good sort of observation. And I would say for sure if it adds to the show, if you're doing things, you know, I mean, how far are we going to take it? Do we want Travis Scott to do his concerts with no auto-tune because, you know, we want him to sing live? I mean, hmm. he can't even do that in the studio. Oh, that's, so, yeah. I mean, you know, I but guess it, it depends. That's part of it. That's become like... His tone and not just a correction thing, you know, whereas like it started off auto tune as a correction thing. But now, you know, T-Pain and all those guys took it to another level. So it's at this point, it's like a distortion pedal. Try, exactly. like, try listening to this without any distortion pedal, just your guitar going straight into an amp. It sounds like crap, you know, without like that gain. So it's that like in those cases, I don't think they're cheating. It's that's the sound, right? But for this debate, I think we should leave it up to you guys. So let us know in the yeah. comments. Do you think backing tracks are acceptable in shows? And to go even farther, we'll, we'll put up a community tab post as well, asking Man. you guys that same question. So hit that subscribe just, and stay tuned. I was just thinking and writing that down. Let's not forget to put that <laughs> yeah. up later. You know. <laughs> same wavelength. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Also, before we forget, like uh, you may have noticed, there was no um, Geezer Butler on this uh, performing live. And it's not because I'm sure the man wanted to be there, but he's had his little, uh, you know, he's he hasn't been doing well with COVID, according to this article. He's been on holiday to Kenya and, and Italy and had an accident on a boat, cracking Ooh. or breaking a rib or two uh, a few weeks ago. So wow. I don't think he was in the greatest of shape to to play there. But I mean, look at Ozzy, like like a champ, you know, after recovering and everything. But I mean, like, yeah, it makes sense that Giza wasn't there. Well, we definitely hope Geezer recovers quickly. A cracking a rib at that age, I mean, at any age, is not fun. Um, but these yeah. guys are so tough, man. I mean, it's, it's, you know, Tony Iommi as well, he just recovered from a, a you know, couple-year-long cancer battle. So, I mean, the fact that we're seeing these guys on stage in yeah. any capacity, I think, is is a, a sign from the, the rock and metal gods. And and sounding this good. Like, yeah, that's man. the thing. This is Better than, you know, look at Motley Crue on stage Better, now, right? Yeah, but like, you know, actually, it's funny that you said that. Uh, like, uh, my brother actually caught them in Buffalo and told me that everything sounded great, man. Def Leppard was killer. Okay. Everybody was great. The, the band sounded tight. 
just thought, you know, like uh, it's Vince Neil is Vince Neil, you know, like very high pitched <laughs> and whatever. But I mean, it is what it is. But no, like I'm saying, like it's 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 cool that like everything is these bands are sounding good, you know, like uh, Ozzy, you know, look, we just heard it sounds great. And I wanted to mention before we forget that the bass player that was playing on what we just saw at the Commonwealth Games was Adam Wakeman. Adam Wakeman, okay, of course, who has done plenty of session work for Ozzy and I believe some some background keyboards and and sort of uh, tracks on the Sabbath tour, which they did not hide, by the way. They were open about having an undercover keyboardist playing in the background. Uh, so yeah, shout out to Adam yeah. Wakeman and definitely a good sounding lineup here for sure. Yeah. Now we're gonna hop into a brand new segment with Sound Mojo's very own George Pacheco, and of no relation to Joe Pacheco. We have to make yeah. the distinction here, Joe. Yeah, it's funny, man, because like I was connected uh, from Raf at Watch Mojo, and like he's like, "Hey, uh, you were related to uh, George Pacheco." I'm like, "Maybe at some point, somewhere down the line, yeah." But no one that I know of personally. So, anyways, they connected us, and he works. He's been working at Watch Mojo as a writer, I believe, a script writer, and, and music content as well since 2016. So he's been here longer than I have been. And uh, yeah, we connected great, uh, you know, he loves music like like we do. So, and then he, you know, he wants to review stuff for us. So now, like, um, we don't know how, if it's going to be weekly or bi-weekly or what it's going to be, but we figured let's get this going. Cineploit Records and the artists yeah. are Panscan and Morlock. So we have two different project reviews. And I think yeah. these are going to be new names for most everybody in our sort of Western uh, listenership, including myself. So this is going to be cool in terms of broadening our musical horizons and really discovering yeah. stuff from all different parts of the world. So let's check in with our man, George Pacheco, and see what he has for us. What's up, guys? This is George from Sound Mojo here, coming at you with my very first video for the channel. Um, I want to spotlight a label called Cineploit Records from Austria. I'm a really big fan, and I'm really excited about the music they've been putting out over the past maybe five or so years. Uh, they're really inspired by Italian genre cinema of the 1970s and 80s. Um, a lot of it is very much rooted in like a synthesizer or a retro prog sort of way, but with a more modern aesthetic and approach. And they have two new releases out, uh, the first of which is a band called Pan Scan. And the album is called A Far Distant Corner of Nothing Special. And it's the brainchild of a man named Christian Rezicek, who's been a member of a number of other Cineploid artists over the years, including uh, Suspetto, who are also worth your time. And it was just released this past July. It's on CD, digital download, and vinyl. Um, and this is very much indebted to sort of the German uh, Berlin School synthesizer soundtrack of the 70s. Um, Artists like Tangerine Dream and Klaus Schultz, um, who were really pushing the boundaries of what was then a very uh, new technology, utilizing synths in a way that was unheard of at the time. And Panscan does a great job at that. And um, this this new one might be some of their best. There's there's five five longish tracks. The last of which is actually 17 minutes, um, but it never really gets boring. Um, the the tunes are well composed and it, it, it really succeeds in hitting you with these layers of synth that uh, wouldn't sound out of, um, out of place on a John Carpenter soundtrack for something like The Thing from Ennio Morricone. Um, and uh, he's really come a long way in bridging the gap from a sound that's clearly indebted to soundtracks from this time that utilize this minimalistic approach to taking that approach and making it bigger and, and more expansive. Um, there's, there's some guitar work on here that adds a layer of depth to the synthesizers, but overall it has this droney, mesmerizing sort of sound that really is perfect for late night drives or it's listening to when you're feeling in a more of a contemplative mood. Um, I think the artwork sort of follows that vibe. It's very spacey and very 70s sort of like retro futuristic um it's a really excellent release and uh, i can't uh, recommend it highly enough another new album from cineploy and it's, it's a bit different it's called morlock and it's their new album called The Outcasts. And this is a bit different. There's still the vibe 
of Italian soundtracks and, and sort of, but it's done in a more progressive rock sort of way, um, similar to uh, a band called Goblin, who released a lot of um, soundtracks to Giallo films, which are sort of like a sleazy Italian thrillers of the 1970s. Um, so this 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 album utilizes a more rock-based structure, um, well, maybe even a little punk rock uh, or, or new wave tossed in for good measure. There's more of a band framework. Um, and this is actually um, another Cineploid house project of sorts. Um, it is uh, a group from a man named Andrew Prestige, who was in another Cineploid artist called Zoltan. Um, who I believe are still active and they're still putting out good stuff. They're, um, the album that comes to mind with their, with their reimagining of the Psychomania soundtrack, a really cool British occult horror movie from the 1970s that's really trippy and far out. And they sort of did their own take on that. Um, but uh, Morlock is more urban, uh, a bit more grounded. Uh, like I said, rock bass, guitars, bass, drums. There's still the retro Moog synth going on, and there's still a, a definite old school vibe, but it doesn't take the approach of just trying to ape uh, styles that came before it. It tries to do something new, and I think it succeeds. Um, there's only seven songs, but they never really get boring. Um, as you can see, the artwork is, has there's some retro synths in, in there, and, and the artwork is suitably trippy for this, sign, this kind of thing. Um, I think it would appeal to not only movie fans, but sort of out there music fans as well who want something a little different um, and don't necessarily need the cinematic connection to uh, enjoy what's going on. Um, so I really can't say enough good things about Cineploit. Um, they're putting out good stuff and it's pretty much under the radar. Um, they put out Blu-rays as well of the movies that they really enjoy. And those are also excellent packages tons of extras and a lot of love put into what they do. Um, so check them out if you're so inclined. They're on Bandcamp, uh, they're on YouTube. You can check these albums out for yourself. Um, thanks again for uh, listening to me ramble about these artists and hope to see you soon. Take care. Big shout out to our friend George Pacheco for the information on the Austrian music. Definitely a lot more coming from his corner over there. And now we're going to hop into the Sound Mojo community tab. Of course, this is the spot on our YouTube channel, which we hope you're subscribed to already, where we put up questions and polls to see what you guys are listening to and also take suggestions on what you think we should be listening to. Now, actually, before we jump into the comments in this one, Joe, we have to go yeah. back to last episode because I did True. promise you guys that I had some homework to do and I was going to be checking out the almighty Def Leppard. And... <laughs> I don't know, Joe. I, I mean, do you want to ask me about this or should I just come out and give you my thoughts? I don't know how we should start. Well, my memory is not too great, but like, <laughs> I think I remember you saying it's just one of those bands you just either didn't get, right? Like, is that what it was, Def Leppard? The thing with me and Def Leppard is that, first of all, none of the people who exposed me to rock really were into them. So that was the first go. thing that like, they were just never really brought up. So the other, it, hold on sorry, to that thought. It, it's important sometimes, right? Like the influence of the person who's telling you this, right? Not very always, much because so. many people have told me bands i'm just like Meh, not into it you know but like it, it helps when someone's really like all oh, right this is great check this out anyway just wanted to add that the other thing is too that the only time i ever heard it was sort of in a parody rock setting like where they were playing pour some sugar on me in a strip club in a movie or in a tv show so i would always be thinking of like yeah. strippers and sort of corny rock um so oh. i think that was the the injustice that i had when facing def leppard Mm -hmm. fair enough that's definitely like you see like i grew up in it so i heard those songs before they became memes let's say right you know so like yeah fair enough for sure now the records that i did check out i i went and i really gave a solid listen to pyromania and the main thing that i would say is i think these guys are a lot more rock solid than the greatest hits can 
can really give them credit for. When you do a little bit of digging, when you listen to some of those deeper cuts, they have a lot more traits of meat and potatoes rock and roll than I really expected. They mm -hmm. reminded me of other groups from the UK more so than I expected. But they're still the king of the choruses. You know, when it comes to the Def Leppard, I think their specialty is the big chorus, the big harmonies, the big power sections. And, you know, I, I, I will say I have a new respect for it, Joe, but still not exactly at the top of my playlist. That's the, that's like you you actually you know like you did the work you did the legwork, give it a shot just like me like I was telling you like uh, before we recorded like with Slipknot it was the same thing I came and when it came out <laughs> everybody was going crazy on it and I, you know and I was just like I listened to it and I should like this but for some reason I'm not so enamored by it I don't know why I don't get it you know so it's fair enough for sure man so you you liked Pyromania it doesn't sound dated to you at this point. It does a little bit, but I mean, you know, I went in also knowing that, you know, I mean, the quintessential 80s sound, I think High and Dry might be the record that I need to get more into, though, because I, I, I don't know if I'm wrong, but is that one a little less commercial, maybe? Oh, yeah, yeah. Big okay. time. It's, I think, I, think it's, uh, I always forget. I think it's their second album. I'm not sure. If, I know On Through the Night, then there's the High and Dry. And that one, yes. even myself... Being already, uh, let's say, a Def Leppard fan when I was a kid, I couldn't get into those earlier albums because they were so different in the sense of more raw, mm. more rock, more ACDC, like, you know, whereas mm. when they got into the Pyromania or I, you hear at the end of um, High and Dry, they had that song, uh, Headed for a Heartbreak. No, no, that's a completely different band. That's a, a Winger. I'm thinking of another song. Oh, okay. anyways, they had the song with the big chorus, you know, and the big vocals, like, like, like you, it almost like was foreshadowing what's coming with Pyromania. What's anyway. coming? Yeah, so I still love Pyromania. Like I'll drop that needle on the first song, and it's like oh, I'm instantly transported. But I totally get it. Like, I listened to the new stuff, and I was like, eh, I can hear those. Like it's getting you know those verses and those choruses are getting a little like whatever tiresome. But fair enough, man. I appreciate the the, the effort. You know. Totally. So what did we have in terms of audience suggestions this week that we had to catch up on? So not Donald Fagan suggested Nas's magic. Ooh, so. yes. Okay. So this actually, I did have some good takeaways from the one thing I have to say, Joe, I think that Nas is a, a great pillar when it comes to the debate of favorite versus best, because I will say Nas is not my favorite rapper. He's not even in my top five. I don't think for personal favorites. But yeah. I do think Nas is the greatest rapper in the game because I, I think he's the quintessential voice in hip hop. So, I mean, I think uh, anytime we hear him speak, I think it just brings us back to the essence of what that music really is, if that makes sense. This is the first, as soon as I pressed play and like the first thing was I was transported almost to like when I discovered hip hop back in the 80s. Nice. Yeah, this tribe called Quest vibes, you know, those yes. type of like I always say, I'm sorry, like I don't want to insult anybody, like I always say intelligent lyrics or something else besides booty and money and Mercedes That's right. and stuff, you know, and how tough I am. Anyway, all that <laughs> to say, I loved it, man. I listened to it. It was instant, like old school beats right away. So it's like it made me feel so comfortable. So that's for me, it was like putting on a glove, right? It just felt good, you know, uh, I definitely playlisted this this album for sure. Some very solid tracks. The other track that that really stood out to me was the Pastures of Plenty by Woody Guthrie. Guthrie, yeah. Now, this is this is a completely new name to me. Oh, yeah? Okay. The name I knew of, but the song, I, I don't know any of his, like, I'm, you know, I'm not a country dude, that's for sure. So, I, that, I but I've always heard of Woody Guthrie or Woody Guthrie. Um, uh, so, Go, solid thoughts? name for a country guy, though. I mean, <laughs> I think that's, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. the quintessential name. Yeah, so what did you think of it? I think it's not necessarily my cup of tea. Uh, when you talk about dated, I think this mm -hmm. this is sort of falls in the into that realm. But again, if you're listening to something from you know one of these eras, I mean, some of his stuff I would assume goes way way back to like the early '60s, maybe even. Um, yeah. you're, you're, that's to be expected. And I think that this almost reminded me more of a folk vibe than it really did of a country vibe in, in a strange True. way. Yeah, and like it's funny because like you say dated, but like is it? It's not dated. I don't think in terms of the production or the the the, the song writing because like you know something like let's say a Def Leppard or whatever you can hear that reverb. It's 
that's tied or that right. effect is tied to that era. This is just like the technologies it wasn't up to par in terms of fidelity, right? So it sounds dated, right? But this yeah. is the charm. This is what I, as soon as I pressed play, again, you know, like I, I even wrote here as a note, like there's something about that I love about vintage recordings, you know, because you mm. can't go back, you can't clean, you can clean it up a bit, but then it would take away the charm, right? So that's probably why yeah. I, li I still like vinyl and stuff. I mean, if you notice the whole song, he's pretty much strumming one chord the whole time, except very for a couple simple. of times where it moves. Yeah, very simple, exactly. So the idea is like, for me, is like these type of songs, like you said, folk, they're stories, they're legends, they're, uh, uh, you know, like uh, uh, poems maybe, you know? So it's more about storytelling, you know, for, for this, this type of stuff. Which song out of the, this week's suggestions would you say was your favorite track? The strongest um, one? Uh, it's hard to say a favorite. I guess maybe the, 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 the Nas. It would be a favorite in terms of the ones that are suggested here. I mean, we had the here who suggested Rue Payne's Open Road, uh, which was really cool because it's like, you know, it's like the whole story is about wanderlust, right? About traveling the world. Uh, and like I've just the other day I've told... Uh, my kids and like I always wanted to I'd love to one day if I won the lottery or whatever was able to do it like just buy myself a huge RV and just hit the road man discover travel personally discover Canada like come on you know let's go from one side to the other do the states somehow you know but or Europe would be great too you know yeah um, so yeah I, I definitely like that one I, you know I wasn't too crazy about the song I mean you know one thing I put here is it sounds like sounds the music like sounds like uh, the voice sounded familiar, but the music sounded like almost like YouTube ads. You know, there's certain YouTube mm. ads where it's ukulele with little bells. Right. <laughs> so, I, I don't know, it made me think of that. little commercial. Yeah, that's it. Um, we also have Exista Probe. Oh, yeah, we, we mentioned that. That was it. Pastures of Plenty by Woody Guthrie. Uh, what about Cole McGinnis, Sweet Home Alabama? Did you hear that one? This one I missed, actually. So I, okay. I'll need you to fill me in a little bit. Yeah, well, well I was surprised when I got there because, I mean, I, I know Sweet Home Ola, uh, Alabama. So when I popped it in, it was a Irish version of it, you Ooh. know, of Sweet Home Alabama. And it was really good. Like, it's cool, you know. And this, what freaks me out is, like, uh, how, like, songs will work. A good song or a song will work any in almost any arrangement or style That's a uh, thing. if it's well done you know and it's so cool you know like when you hear those mashups of uh i don't know first one that comes to mind is let's say like the trooper iron Maiden's the trooper mashed up with michael jackson's uh beat it it just works oh, wow. man it just works you know i gotta even check that ozzy. out for the next show <laughs> there was even one of ozzy where he's doing over the mountain live from the 80s and it's being played by a reggae band reggae ska what? band you know and it just that's amazing works perfectly it, dude, you, yeah, yeah search these things up they're hilarious so that's what i love about like mashups where it's like e e or remixes i always like taking the vocal away from one song and either building a new song around it or throwing it on top of another song and mashing it up so that was what was cool about the suggestion of uh colm mcginnis sweet, Mo sweet home alabama and uh <laughs> irish that was pretty cool um deadly destruct may i recommend anything by oh yeah by Citizen Soldier or Mercy Street by Peter Gabriel. So Citizen, Citizen Soldier, Soldier, that was a solid track. Yeah, yeah. I like, like Run Away From Myself. Yeah, ex ah, that's the one I put in as well, yeah. Uh, and, like, it's funny because, like, reminded me of, like, that mid-2000s Breaking Benjamin kind of vibe, right? The big production. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, good songs. Like I almost heard know. a hint of K-pop in it in a weird way. Just with the way that he was phrasing it, I was like, I oh. could, if, if they took made a Korean version of this song, I could definitely hear it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I didn't, know, I didn't pick up on that, but uh, definitely got that uh, 2000s vibe. Um, Mercy Street by Peter Gabriel. And another person, Anne Hart, also added Shaking the Tree. I don't know if you got the chance to check a out the Peter, Peter Gabriel, Gabriel. stuff. A lot of Peter Gabriel. This guy's yeah. pretty new to me, actually, but I keep hearing him coming up more and more lately. It seems like well, his stuff was ahead of its time. Well, exactly. He was, he's definitely not new, that's for sure. But like, yeah. uh, and myself, like I've known him my, you know, I guess my entire musical life, let's say in the sense of like from the Genesis days to when I was a kid growing up, the Soul album with Sledgehammer and all those legendary videos and massive songs. And I love that album produced by Daniel Lanois, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Uh, so that was definitely a staple in my listening, you know, and stuff. But for some, again, same thing with your Def Leppard or with like Slipknot or whatever it is. I could never get into Peter Gabriel on mm. his own before the Soul album. And even with Genesis, I could tolerate, you know, it, it sounds like I'm saying something rude, tolerate him with Genesis. No, he's <laughs> great in Genesis. But 
for some reason, like the there's only a couple of things I could listen to him in Genesis that I'm like, uh, I prefer to Phil Collins era of Genesis or both of them together. Anyway, yeah, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but uh, yeah, basically, it's a big gap in my knowledge as well of uh, Peter Gabriel's the first four albums of uh, solo work and stuff. A bit like not not as familiar with it, but the guy. I mean, his legend, his his reputation precedes him, right? Like, I mean, that's the thing, always, right? And even in the world g- music genre, like people just love him because, like, there was another version of this song, I believe that was like with um, Yusu Nudor, I think, you know. So, like, there's he's done a lot of that stuff over the last few decades, you know. So, uh, so he's no, one of the guys who can really take it and stretch yeah. it, kind of like you know, like you're saying about you know the Aussie remixes and stuff like that. If it's a great yeah. quality song, it can be done in many different renditions yeah. and styles. And I was lucky, man. Like uh, my last gig, I got to go to his studio, uh, Real World Studios in London or Bath, I think, outside of London. And it was like something to see, you know, even just the wow. outside was just like in terms of just like landscaping was like beautiful. And the inside was like whatever. There was a session going on, so I couldn't spend too much time. Did they give tours was, or uh, was it a... Uh well like in this case I didn't by. there was more of a business meeting but like right. uh, we had a nice lunch and everything but like it was uh, there was like a jazz session going on which is something I would have totally loved to have like, been sick. a fly on the wall and you know yeah um, so that was it man so again we thank you everyone I hope we're not forgetting anybody for the suggestions uh, you know we always appreciate this uh, Friday again we'll ask for more and uh, we'll check it out over the weekend and uh, get, be back with uh, <laughs> our thoughts on these things here we asked, who is your favorite singer? And I'm curious to see what we got as a response. It's like such an open-ended question. That's you know? it. Like, who's your favorite singer? You know? <laughs> uh, well, your favorite, actually, initially it was who's the best singer. That one, like, forget it, you know? I'm not into that's those kind of things. I'm like, yeah, fight. I can only answer for singer? my own tastes. Well, that's it, right? So we have John Johnson. I'm currently a big fan of Labyrinth, both melodically and technical ability, and also his vocal tone. Um, anyone you're familiar? I'm not familiar with Labyrinth. I've, I've heard of the, sounds the like name. I'm not be. familiar, yeah. though. Yeah. Yeah. And then I love uh, melodies that Jesse Reyes comes up with, and I Ooh. love her vocal tone as well. Yeah. Another I'm big name lately, definitely. She was actually just in town, actually, over mm-hmm. here. Matthew Robinson. Never have I heard a voice more powerful than Kurt Cobain. Ooh, the man himself, which I just saw recently, by the way, that the way he sang actually caused him severe stomach problems. Really? Yeah, he would actually regularly spit up blood. And uh, when you listen to the like the raspiness of his voice, I guess he he had no formal training and, and it was very bad for his system. And that was actually one of the main reasons he picked up drugs was from the pain. So, I mean, uh, a pretty crazy hmm. tortured story from him all around. Yeah. Uh Akalia or Asalia Saraya. I love the oldies. I gotta go with old blue eyes himself. <laughs> ah, the man himself. There you go. That's, that's, such, that's a uh, solid. Whenever someone answers that as, as their favorite singer, that's a solid answer. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's like uh, what's his, what's um, Tony Bennett, right? I mean, that's like, it. Yeah, he's he's almost talking more than he is singing, <laughs> yeah. but it's just it's so just cool, his voice. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's just so cool. Uh, here. How could I pick a favorite when there are so many fantastic singers out there and everyone with a unique voice? There you go. Hey, here. I hear you. So we have PEP Leather Lab. Some people just judge singers on show performance. Some judge singers on vocal quality. Neither are really that reliable individually. Okay. How how about we meet somewhere in the middle and select people with fantastic voices that had a really good shows throughout their careers? That's pretty good. Man, I would say that Steve that. Perry and... Sade, I guess. Yeah, Sade. Their voices were always outstanding and their shows never disappointed. Gotta say, man, <laughs> there's nothing for... Uh, I, I That's don't even, a great I can't, comment. I can't even yeah. add to it. Yeah, exactly. It's perfect. Prince the Legend by Weezy yep. Stu9, definitely. Um, Pasquale M. Bisic- Biseglia. Uh, I like Britney... Oh, yeah, I like Britney Spears and Laurie hey. Berkner. Not familiar okay. with Laurie Berkner. My Britney God. Spears, I'm surprised. Yeah, I love how like I'm just being slapped left and right with new names. All these new names. I should know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, GameX Simmons, Alessia Cara probably, but I think you've mentioned that before, GameX, a couple of times. I think that's Yeah, <laughs> big Alessia fan. Another Sade by the, n- not Donald Fagan. Definitely Sade. I mean, come on. Definitely. So smooth, so perfect. Uh, Jason Derulo. Hmm, that's an Ooh. interesting one. I wouldn't have okay. thought of as a singer, you know, but definitely that guy, like at one point I'd like, I think, three songs in the top 10 in the same summer you know and he's kept it going for years now so i mean definitely still in high demand jason derulo 
Yeah. Well, thanks for that, Levy Giles or Gilles. <laughs> Solid responses. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, very good. You? Any favorite singers that come to mind? Hmm. The first so people many. that come to my mind, definitely Frank Ocean, 100%. Okay. Uh, I thought you were going to say, say Frank Zappa. <laughs> Frank Zappa. Okay, well, <laughs> maybe for guitar. And yeah. honestly, man, Ozzy's up there for me too, just for when it comes to unique vocal style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, definitely. What, like, it's funny because I would never think of saying Ozzy, but like, yeah, it's just so unique, and he just nails it. It's his. It's his, it's him. You know, like there's no. He's not trying to be anybody else. Never was. Uh, I asked this question, but it's so funny, man, because I can't even think of one. There's so many. I mean, like, wow. I don't know why I can't think of one like that. You know, uh, that I've listened to even maybe re recently. I don't, I don't even know. It's a, that, this is a tough there's call. So man. many, I, man. That's the thing. Another a Canadian uh, guy, Ian Thornley. I don't know if you're familiar with. I Big definitely Rex. know the name. Big Wreck, the band. Okay, yes, definitely, yeah. Not only he's, can he's this a powerhouse, guy, man, dude. Like when this, I discovered this guy, like in '99 or 2000, when I got the album, and it's like, wow, what a voice! Like, what a voice! I'm just like, that's the voice I want as a singer, or if I was a singer, that's the voice I want. Power, nice. The Chris Cornell vibe, you know, like that kind mm. of thing. But then I discovered this guy's a monster guitar player as well. So anyway, on top so of he's it, probably what, yeah. He's guy like a monster guitar player. That's insane. And a monster singer, you know, like wow, what a what a powerhouse. So that would I would say, you know, like would be probably one of my favorites. That's favorite a good singers. pick. Here we asked, which is more important to you? Music, movies, TV, video games, or sports? A lot of options here. <laughs> I like options. <laughs> <laughs> so, and what yeah, came so out on top? 128 votes. We have music at 63%, which obviously I'm not surprised. Uh, not surprised. Games, Video games with 21% in second place going... Uh, at one point, it was a little more neck and neck at the beginning of the poll. Uh, we have movies at 9%, and then we have sports at 4%. So that makes sense. Let's see what the comments say. So HWC Transgender Ministries, welcome back. Music, movies, TV, he, he loves them all. Games are all amazing. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> Not Donald Fagan. Tough cycle things, for sure. Uh, music is the most the cornerstone of his life, but I devote time to NBA content, Raptors podcast. Yeah, that's good. Dedicated. Fans. Nice. Uh, I love movies to pass the time. So yeah, pretty much like us, right? Like we're all like, you know, we all love movies to pass the time and video games. Um, game Casual fan. Music is my life. And Colton R. Magby go through them all at some point or another. For sure. I actually voted go. video games on this one because I wanted to push it a bit more because I play a lot of games. Uh, I find it's my meditation. Like That's your main getaway and, outside of music? Sort of. You know, like a quick. You know, like I can be in a game within a few minutes and already not thinking about everything else, you know? like But I, I prefer going on bike rides or walks. That's for sure. That's a solid what one. About you? What about you? What I've you been pick? watching more documentaries lately and more movies. Yeah. I've been, I actually just watched... The brand new Netflix doc on Woodstock '99, which yeah. was really really cool, and so yeah, I've been I've been so I guess my vote would have to be movies for now. But okay. uh, honestly, what's more important to me in general, probably music. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, same here. I've been watching lately. The only thing I don't watch much TV, man. I've almost at the point of canceling my Netflix subscription and stuff. I don't watch TV, uh, but. Now, I've been watching, I'm almost at the last couple episodes of Sandman, new series. Sandman, oh, yeah, how's that? Sandman. I like it. I wasn't familiar with decent. the guy before or the whole storyline behind it, but like I like the whole dream, the whole aspect of that, the, you know, just the way they did it. I, I thought it was an intelligent way to do like a sort of superhero, you know, not the typical just flying and, you know, <laughs> lasers Same old. and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Here we ask, name a TV show with a great theme song. And and by the way, Old Man Simpson, 200 channels and nothing but cats. That sounds, I, I want to sign up for that cable package. It's a lot better than the news, I think. <laughs> it's called YouTube. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm TikTok game for that. at this point, right? Cat videos. <laughs> It gets crazy, cat videos. Like, like it's it's funny because like any new technology, what are you gonna find? Especially like what's digital, you're gonna end up getting cat and porn. On That's it, right? I think cats is the number two category. <laughs> yeah, probably. Hopefully, number one. But anyway, hopefully. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, we have PEP Leather Lab, massive attack. Always seem to do amazing work on TV shows. So Paradise Circus, Luther is a favorite. I'm a huge massive okay. attack fan. So like, I know is there's that, another that's a production company. No, it's a band. You should check them out. Okay, Trip Hop massive from the attack. The UK, which you know, I'm gonna probably be adding to the conspiracy or the rumors that apparently they may be, or the singer may be, or is. Anyways, I'm getting I'm trying to make it more mysterious than it is, but it may be Banksy. 
You ever hear of Banksy, the artist, the graffiti guy? Yes. Well, apparently, like a lot of the where it was popping up, Massive Attack was on tour or in the area or something okay. like that. So it's being interesting. Rumored, you know, so an nobody alias knows who it is. artist. This would be cool yeah. to, to expose. Yeah, there's someone else here that mentioned also Massive Attack from the I think it's the series House. Uh, the, yeah, there you nice. go. Nice. Uh, okay, there the, yeah. the nameless Gula. That's it. There you go. House. Yeah, I remember that show. Pumpkin okay, Brewster. so I do know them then. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. I'm sure you've heard of them. Like you've I've heard definitely of that. heard had the house theme song. So guttural reef, punky Brewster. <laughs> That's definitely one okay. from when we were kids. Yeah. I don't know uh, that one. Uh, the name is Gula. Yes, house. Uh, what, excited mileage. Really mice. Really nice. <laughs> Sorry, the loud house. The hmm. loud house. Okay. I'm not familiar with that one. The Flintstones. I mean, come on, Lorenzo Solid. Solid. Solid man. Every day of my coming home for lunch from school, <laughs> the Flintstones. <laughs> that was played, the theme you know? song. Yeah, yeah, no. Like as soon as I got home, it was twelve o'clock. Boom, start eating, and it's like the Flintstones are on. For me, it's Sean Family Gagnon. Guy. Oh yeah, yeah, that's for sure. The uh, second Miami you Vice. hear that first line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sean Gagnon, Wound, Wound Socket, Rhode Island, the Miami Vice. I mean, legendary, and now it's like seems to be all the rage, right, with the uh, the synth wave and all that stuff. It's coming back. Ken Ulzola Ulozis, Charmed, the original, and then Buffy. I, I, I oh. watched Charmed, definitely watched Charmed back then in the day, but not Buffy stuff, but yeah. I used to watch Buffy because my neighbor was really into it when we started hanging out, and uh, yeah, they had all the DVDs, so I was like, I guess it's it's a Buffy season. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Game X Simmons, Cheers. I mean, yeah, of course. That's like one of the all Okay, the, uh, the norm from Cheers, okay. Yeah, that's it. Uh, and Kit Ilamkar, Ilamkar. Sorry, I butchered your name, but Peaky Blinders. <laughs> We're trying. Definitely. And here, uh, Doctor Who. That's for sure. There's so many. I mean, like, you know, like I'm growing up just with sitcoms, like uh, when I was a kid, like the vintage ones. Uh, Three's Company has like uh, an amazing one, The Golden Girls. Uh, I mean, you had to have amazing uh, theme to catch people, to catch people, right? To keep people there, you know? So yeah, moving over to Twitter, like we, I, you know, I forgot, I apologize last time, but we had done something similar on Twitter, and this time we also got a couple of reactions. So we have here, even though from Grace Duff, even though it's usually the season finale when they play it on Supernatural, Carry On My Wayward Son by Kansas. Oh, that's cool. I love that song. Okay. Are you familiar with that one? Yeah, that, that definitely an all-time classic. Yeah, yeah. And the Stranger Things, that's for sure. That, like, that when that sort of came out in 2016 i remember that that whole synth sound the, the arpeggiation like made you think of like carpenter-esque kind of uh themes from from like i feel like shows. an outcast from society for not watching stranger things i feel like i have to start watching to, to, to earn my citizen card yeah yeah i know i watched the first <laughs> season when it came out but then i haven't really uh watched anything after that um we have great stuff with another one kim possible i remember oh that show. classic but i was already like an older kid, you know, before I had to get <laughs> at that yeah. point. But I remember it being a cool show and a theme. The Punisher, definitely. Uh, Smallville, Freddy, F Freddy, uh, Fred Kentrow, Smallville. I'm not familiar with that one, but my friends had a song on that soundtrack. This is a big song. For them. Big, big yeah. show. Yeah, back in the day that we never got to see him fly, right? That was the whole thing. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we have Just Zilla, Amphibia. That's a show, I guess. Yeah, I don't remember. I don't know that one. Not familiar. Why do they keep making me do this? Anyways, so I look, there's a whole bunch here. Um, Doctor anyway, Who, of I think that one was. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, Sons of Anarchy, for sure. Nice. Uh, Sopranos, I'll throw that the in X there Files. too. The X Files, for sure. Yes. The Fall Guy. I mean, like, it just goes on and How on. How about Breaking so, yeah. Bad, too, by the way? Brown now. Dude, genius, right? Because <laughs> it's like four seconds, five seconds. Done, yeah, that's you know? a, that's I an mean, epic uh, ringtone. Modern too. Family. Obviously, you have like the Big Bang Theory, like brilliant, brilliant songwriting in terms of like what it's actually saying. Yeah, amazing, amazing stuff. And I got to throw in a, an honorable mention, yeah. SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> Listen, I, if there's not someone who doesn't know who lives in a pineapple under the sea, we all know the answer to that question, my friends. Yeah, a, a, theme, a TV show with a great song for me would be like Transformers, the cartoons, you know? Like, okay. Uh, definitely, you know? Like Power Rangers that. too. now that I'm thinking of, of, of the songs. Yeah, I can Joe, we can go Rangers. through all those cartoons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but definitely, yeah, Transformers would be like one of my favorites for sure of all time. Nice. 
So now we're going to hop into our interview portion of today's show with the man himself, David Strickland. Of course, if you're familiar with the world of hip-hop and rap, especially out of Canada, this is probably a name that's familiar to you. He's worked with the likes of Chaos, Drake, and many, many more, just to name a few. And this guy is an incredible engineer and producer. We talk with him about a variety of subjects, including his indigenous background, the way that things are progressing right here in the country with indigenous folks, especially in the world of entertainment and being represented. We also talk about Toronto being included in the top names of music on the world stage. And you guys do not want to miss his thoughts on this. And what I loved about this, Joe, is that David was telling us, look, I'm not surprised to see Toronto being number one. This is actually long overdue, which I I sort of like that attitude. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, partly responsible or part of it you know uh the whole scene and bringing it up there and all that yeah for sure uh you know i love what he said also you know sometimes i get tired of it and that's why i go to the states you know like (laughs) uh, you know move around a lot but also like it's it was interesting to see someone who also when you get fed up or saturated with music you move on to other things right yeah the nice painting behind him the nice backdrop he had he's Um, great at painting yeah and another thing i was thinking about with the whole in, in 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 indigenous uh people and his album the whole point we have this interview is for his album is like when i asked the question of like you know do you as actually see change or or experience change and he said yeah and that made me happy because you always see things being brought up and then put away and we forget about them because you know like we use, right. move on to the next thing we're talking about will smith for like a week and then we exactly forget about will smith you know so Amber these heard are, and yeah, that's it. these are problems that like have been around forever. So we, you know, let's get rid of them, man. Let's move on, you know. So I'm glad to see that there's a bit, uh, you know, that they can experience that there is a change, you know, and they are re- better represented, especially in Canada. Anyway, the state seems to be a whole different ball game, you know. As he says, right? Exactly. So I mean, you know, th- these are issues that we continue to face and will continue to bring awareness to. But definitely a pleasure to speak with David Strickland himself, and we'll catch up with you guys right after our chat with him. David Strickland, thank you so much for joining us on this new episode of Inner Sleeve. Thanks for having me. Yeah, 100%. So I know it's been a, a super busy time talking about uh, the new record that's coming up. Maybe give us a little insight on the uh, promo run that you've had going on the last little while. You know, I started last summer. I dropped the first single, Messenger, with, um, you know, uh, Eric Sermon from EPMD, I Love My Nature, and Socrates. So the idea was to, you know, drop a few more before I started back and I kind of got slowed down a bit, but I came back with um, Beast Mode mm. and then Fire Keepers. And now we're going to hit you with Level Up. And then the album's dropping August 16th. So, or sorry, August 26th. So it's almost like a full year run <laughs> that I kind of did unintentionally. Um, I kind of wanted to give the song, the first song, a little time to breathe and then come up with a game plan. And, you know, um, this, the album's got 14 songs. So there's a lot of meat and potatoes there. It's pretty solid. Um, it's kind of a, I guess it's kind of like a slice of my life in the last, I wrote it, wrote it in within a year. There's one or two songs that were kind of lingering around just before or during the pandemic that that was a time when I wasn't planning to do a second album. So, you know, I snatched those up because that's kind of maybe what started the ball, ball rolling. But for the most part, it was done within that time frame. So with about a year and a half, I wrote it in a year and a half. So I'm pretty happy with what I came with within that time frame under the circumstances. You know, you know, I was moving around because I, I was crossing the border during the pandemic, but it, you couldn't get people to come in as much. So a lot of people were sending me files sort of thing, right? Mm. Yeah, that's what I was wondering about. I mean, when you're collaborating with so many people, like, was it mostly through files? And and when you're doing these songs, are you bringing these songs to people or was it more of an overall collaboration? 
Uh, some cases, yes. Some cases, I, I just had to get... I mean, you couldn't really... It wasn't like before, and I, I prefer to be in the studio together. Sometimes you don't have a choice, right? But yeah. this kind of was like, I guess I don't really have a choice. I've got to work the best I can. There was situations like um, when Jordan, Jordan and Stumps came in and did their vocals with me in the studio. There's, there was people that are close, like, you know, Q Rock's in the same city. People were, might have been in town. It was easy. But it wasn't always like that. A lot of the songs I had to get files, which, you know, it's not so bad, but sometimes you have to say, hey, can you do that again? Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> when you're in the same room, you know. Or what I do is I pick and choose, and sometimes I don't know if people don't like that, but I'm I'm infamous for taking out editing background vocals, and I okay. don't like too many backups nowadays. Back in the day, it was like four or five layers of backups and ad-libs, and... You know, times have changed, but sometimes less is more. So I'm, you know, people don't usually get at me unless they really, really have a problem with it. So I try to use common sense, you know, like things are cluttered. You don't want to hear that. But, well, they must yeah. learn to trust your ear as well through, through the years. Some people do. You'd be surprised. You know? <laughs> You'd be Lots. surprised. I mean, so a lot of people, you know, I get it. It's out of respect. And I, I feel like I know what I'm doing. So maybe... <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe a slight idea of what you're doing. Uh, so I mean, in maybe terms I'm of too cranky and people don't want us to ask and put their hands up. <laughs> <laughs> They're intimidated. So who I mean, in, in terms of like picking the people to collab with, I'm curious who were the first people that sort of entered your mind, and and what is the process like when it comes to actually approaching folks? Well, this time around, I kind of didn't. I wanted to include new people I hadn't worked with on the last album. And that's not always easy. And I had to lean on some of my friends that I've been making music with for years, guys like Socks and Eric Sermon. Actually, I wasn't even going to ask Eric to be on the song. He, I was working on it down there and he heard it and was like, yo, this is dope. So, I mean, nice. that's the magic you want. Um, mm. But there's a couple guys I had to lean on. Obviously, Q-Rock, but Q-Rock's only on one song. You know, and it... It's hard to plan this type of project, right? Um, especially when there's so many artists on it. Um, so I kind of, I go with the flow too. And then I have my wish list. And I don't okay. always get my wish list. Um, I did get my favorite Canadian MC on the album. So I was happy about that because he wasn't on the first project. Um, so, you know, you got to kind of take give and take, right? No, 100%. I mean, you, you know, in terms of the Toronto scene as well, I'm, I'm curious, you know, we're seeing so many different artists bubbling up and, and so many new opportunities. I'm just curious how, how you feel that the scene is going right now, especially, you know, now that we're sort of slowly oh. climbing out of the pandemic. Unbelievable. There's so many artists that can't even keep up with who's new. I used to have my thumb on the pulse of everybody, but the city's grown so much. Hip hop's grown so much. I'm like not trying to be in the position I was when I was younger, where I had the energy to just be doing everything. And there's no way, I mean, there's so many artists, so it's, it's beautiful to see, but at the same time, um, you know, things are all good. Like not everybody's going to be my cup of tea. So I'm mindful of like, there's going to be, you know, people I'm not into that people love. And I don't hate on new people or, you know, saying like, what people yeah. are, you know, I love it. I'm like, Oh, I cheer them on. I don't get it, but I'm good. <laughs> you may not get it. <laughs> yeah, do you think? You know, it can't be a player hate it, you know. So so yeah, it's exciting because my whole career has been about blowing up the city. So the city blew up, you know, um, and what's there left to do but keep blowing mm. up other other stuff, right? So I've moved on. Um and I keep moving on, keep trying to evolve and do new new things. So we'll see what happens. I was curious, like, uh, you're like, you know, the producing for the last 25 years. And so like, how did you get started in it? What was the, what led you to, you know, I'm, I'm assuming you were like rapping and seeing and stuff, but then like, what led you into the actual, uh, the, the, the engineering of it and stuff? I was DJing. Then I started MCing and then I started learning how to produce. Uh, one of my friends rumble from rumble and strong was, um, had an SP 1200 and I was going to a studio and I didn't, I wasn't really into gear and all that stuff yet, so I didn't know how to do anything. So I kind of learned from watching them and then borrowing equipment. And then when I started hanging around Trebus Institute, which used to be at um, Dundas in Parliament, and this is like in the early 90s, 
I started uh, going to AudioFlex, which is a studio in the basement, and they had two engineers, Gadget, who mix a lot of Drake records. Uh, most mm -hmm. of the Drake records, are some some with me and some with Forty and some on his own, but he mixed the majority of them up to he retired. But he was one of the first people to teach me. I took some courses and stuff like that, but I started moving from being an artist to learning how to engineer. And production wasn't really my focus. It kind of just was there. And I was doing it on the side. And it, it, I got better at it over time. Doing so many records on a high level that I was like, man, I got to start producing more. Like, because right. when you're an engineer, you're not getting royalties. Yeah. You're right. doing all these records and you're just like, it's great and I love it. And you do put get to put that energy into it. But, you know, you, you kind of get, it's like anything else. You, you want to evolve. So I evolved from that. And then I started going back to being more artistic with it. So, you know, it kind of came full circle. You know, there's, um, I, I'm spitting on fire keepers. I don't normally spit on anything. I don't normally rap anymore. So that, I'm doing it more for fun. I'm not trying to be an MC anymore. I, I pretty much, my I've had a career in music that I can be proud of and be happy about. And I'm more just having fun. And that's what got me into this was having fun. So like, you know, if you can make money having fun, doing something you love, then, you know, that's really, true. That's the key. Yeah, right. So, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm trying to help other people, really. It's not these albums aren't about me, they're producer albums or my producer albums, but I'm trying to expose these dope artists to the, to the yeah. world. And they're, they're already doing their things, but I mean, you know, why not? Right? Yeah. Well, it's a platform as well, right? That, yeah, that exactly. you're able to provide. Yeah. Bad things happen to those I care about. Street life's real, man. Ain't no pebble mount. One hand sets you up, the other tears you down. Focus on your team when you share a fair amount. So get without expectations, don't compare and count. Focus on bank accounts, investing in big amounts, perfecting the in and outs. Really, what it's been about. They won't let you know, talking about those early days when you were transitioning from the DJ stuff into the, the the producing and mixing how big of a transition is that exactly because i mean i feel like it's somewhat in the same world but also not well today would be totally different okay I mean, today there's tons of technology and i'm going back to like we didn't even you weren't even recording on computers back then right yeah. you might have sequenced on the computer um if you didn't have a, like a drum machine that had a sequencer in it or a keyboard with a sequencer like um i have one right here eps 16 plus that has a sequencer and you could sample, right? You'd have to use a sequencer. There was very different ones, Cubase, Notator. They were on old Macs and Ataris. Things were slow, you know, think it wasn't yeah. like you could just jump right into it. You had to learn, oh. and gear was expensive. So, I mean, hmm. um, you know, <laughs> to try to get something like that, it's not like you could get a crack version, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, it was totally a different, different game ball. now. Yeah, man. So, like, uh, you had to really love it or you had to have money and some people had right. money, right i didn't have money i had to save up for everything and i was lucky that i had people around me that were willing to teach me and lend me um things to evolve and i really struggled for a long time i was lucky enough to have access because i was engineering at so many studios i had access to equipment so i didn't really necessarily have my own equipment but uh, if I have keys and it's, you know, sessions are done, I can stay and work on stuff. And, you know, that's kind of how I survived and evolved. And, you know, um, I've slowly got my own stuff. And you got to have, you got to have ambition, I guess, you know, like if you yeah. really want to do it. So, I uh, you know, I had that ambition and I wish I had more, but I did as much as I could, you know. You find like, uh, you know, obviously back then, like uh, an SP12 was like five grand for like, uh, yeah. what, a, a second of sampling. And whereas today... 50 bucks you have endless amount of sampling do you yeah. find the options too many options today when you work or are you still like no no you, you, no you love it you've embraced like it. uh the whole thing i love it there's so much more fun you could do like with warping and chopping mm. and i'm just like man i don't even have the time to get into all the stuff you could do <laughs> i wish i was 16 now and with you know because yeah, i'd have the time and energy and I, the, the drive to just start trying stuff that i never thought of like there's so much it's unbelievable you know and you know thankfully it's uh, helping the music grow so you know maybe we'll get a new genre out of it hopefully. yeah that'd be really cool to see you know you mentioned a young ovo 40 and sort of being in the same circles and learning from some of the same folks 
how would you describe the OVO circle sort of at that time before obviously, you know, they were even near popping off kind of thing. What, what was the, the atmosphere like with them? Well, at that time I wasn't really here. I was in the U S a lot. I used to go down and spend most of my time there and come back and I'd spend a little bit of time here and go back. So when that was kind of forming a bubbling, I was down with the death squad, just working with Keith, hanging out with E, you know, um, Red God, I think that was just after we did Red Gone Wild. It okay. was around Blackout 2. When I was doing Blackout 2, I was in Atlanta, New York, back Boston. I was in Toronto. I was bouncing around doing all kinds of stuff. So I kind of missed a lot of that. When the first mixtape dropped, and that was whole blown up, uh, it was in Atlanta. And then I came home, and we did Thank Me Later. And that's kind of when, when I first started meeting everybody and hanging around those guys so i kind of missed a big there was a big gap for me because from about i want to say oh four i was not really here a lot I okay was, you know yeah i was hiding out in america and back and forth and and i missed a lot i kind of was at a point in my career with canadian music where i'd done everything mm. and and i didn't feel like there was anything here for me. And I told this story before where I had a few deaths around that time. One of my friends was murdered and that kind of made me reevaluate my life. And, yeah. and I kind of just changed my vibe and, and started doing, you know, doing things on a whole other level. Um, and then I came back and ended up working on those records, which was crazy because now those records define a lot of like when I'm in America, people know about, like it kept me relevant. So it's wild how, I was home for a bit and then we got to end up being working on the biggest records in the world. So like shout out to them for that because man, that really helped too. Right. So like, yeah. So the yeah. story starts getting layers. So by the time I'm not really here, I start getting layers and sit, and then the Drake stuff starts happening and then you get layers. And then I get to the point where I'm like, okay, what else can I do? Right. And then I have my own personal journey going on and I go, and that's when I discover that. Um, the indigenous hip hop is popping so much that I feel like, yo, what are you guys doing? And then I start going on this mission to meet artists and start producing. And then one day I'm like, wait, I got like a bunch of songs here with you guys. Why don't I just put out an album? All right. Yeah. And, then, and then what happened was the label started here and I was doing an album. And then they started <laughs> coming for me. And I was like, oh, this is cool. Cause maybe, the snowball effect. Yeah, maybe y'all can, maybe we can elevate the game here. Like, I wasn't mm -hmm. planning, like, there was no agenda or anything. It was just like, it just evolved naturally. And then, you know, after that album dropped and uh, we did the room with Apple Music, it just like, you know, now we're opening doors and we're putting yeah. on bigger platforms and all the other platforms started doing things. And, you know, now, you know, it's, it's, and I, it's not just me, it was already happening. I just kind of came in and was like, wow. Let me add my two cents, right? And right, you know, when I'm gone, it's gonna, you know, keep going, hopefully, and and it's gonna like be, you know, like it's amazing because now that empowers the people where they can make money where they weren't making money, you know, like there's so many opportunities now that weren't available before, and it's more about bringing these artists into the visible forefront because mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter what your background is as long as you're dope people are gonna yeah. buy your music right you can be from anywhere i don't care I, I love i love music from all over the world and all kind of genres so i mean you know and indigenous people we don't just do hip-hop we don't just do rock there's you know we're like anybody else so it's it's truly dope and i'm happy to was able to have an impact in that regard you know if i can say i did that I didn't realize the impact I've had on Canadian music. So, you know, I don't really, you know, big up my chest about that. I just kind of like keep it humble. And, That's what yeah. makes you you, man. That's what makes you like evolve and move on and, and you know, open new doors and opportunities. And, and what's cool is like today, the industry, you know, like we have like all the gatekeepers are sort of gone and anybody can release anything. Yeah. But the benefit of, but the benefit of that is that like uh, the indigenous community, you, you, a lot of those communities are stuck in their, just their little community and they can't get out. Now you can get out. And like you said, once yeah. people hear you, they don't care. They don't care. Like they don't, you know, they don't really need to know like your backstory. They just love your stuff, you know? So it's great. Now I'm trying to be like, what's next? What am I going to do next? What's <laughs> next? What's next? It'll well, come. That's, the tr that's it. Do you exactly. feel like there's a uh, more representation and inclusivity in hip hop when it comes to the indigenous community? Because one thing I've heard mentioned, you know, in your chats and other, other folks as well, 
is that there seems to be almost a disconnect as if the indigenous community is outside of hip hop, but you're saying it's in hip hop and this is inherently part of who we are. Well, yes, but there is, um, you see, there's some people who want to keep it saying native hip hop and there's some people who it's just mm. like it's hip hop, but then there's, there's actual, you know, the industry that is slowly becoming aware of us, you know, and, right. was, and, and a lot of the artists, a lot of people I meet that I show are like, wow, they had no idea. So that's yeah. been, we're trying to integrate everybody and we could still have both. There's no rules here, but like we need, we need to move forward with like, you know, um, any other type, you know, because there's all kinds, of, and that's what made me think of this was I was on Apple Music and I'm like, damn, there's French hip hop, there's Iranian hip hop. Why this? It's all these different hip hop sub genres or, or based on low geography, and yet we aren't represented. So, you know, now we are, but at the same yeah. time, it's like, you know, we need to, we need to have that unity. So I'm all for that. Do you feel things progressing like in the country? How do you feel just as an individual, maybe not even musically? Do you feel like sort of reparations are being made and that we're, we're moving forward? I'm just curious. Uh, more so in Canada, I think. When I'm in the U.S., okay. it's almost like we don't exist. Um, hmm. You know, most of my friends, when we're down there, <laughs> one of my friends, but I was down last summer. Well, I'm down a lot, but when my friends, especially indigenous friends, are in town, I'm like, okay, Everybody's gonna think we're Mexican or Puerto Rican. I'm just worried. <laughs> and then that's what happens. So when my friend was down the other day and he's a big guy. And I'm like, dude, everybody's gonna call you Poppy. He's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> he's from way up north. As soon as he got there, he's like, dude, I see what you mean. And I'm like, <laughs> it's New York. It's brutal. People that, but you know, I it's it's a different climate, right? So I kind of gotta, you know, some people not everybody's like that, but yeah. a lot of people. So it's it's funny, but it's not funny. You know, because yeah. and down there we're kind of like out of sight, out of mind. Whereas we have more visibility. I, from my experience in Canada, we have more visibility. People aren't as you know. Whoa, I get sometimes depending on what I'm, how I look, I get like people that's like freaked out. You know, <laughs> it's yeah. Just like, what do you mean? What? What's the problem? Yeah, we're still here. You know, like it's mm. weird, man. So it's America is such a different place. I love it so much, but it's really. The cl you know, depending on where you are, it's that's the beauty of it. It's so big, and there's so many yeah. cities and places that Canada's bigger, but we don't have as many people, and we don't have as much yeah. settlements. And you know what I'm saying? Like, yep. like yep. Hamilton's a close city, but like down there, there's like I don't know, it's just way much more. And there's it's it's I notice the differences, so I'm like always very talking. spread out too. Yeah, it's 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 quite incredible, you know. So it's I notice the differences. That's all. So have you had any like actual positive experiences since oh, the yeah. movement? Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's good. Because like I always feel like there's always like an uprising. Uh something happens, an uprising, we become aware, and then it just sort of dies down Everybody until until the next one, you know? Yeah. You know, one thing I'm curious about, about we were talking, you know, the Toronto music scene and in the beginning when you were sort of in the in the States, when you were more so in the States and, and sort of not involved in Canada, could you ever have pictured a day when Toronto would be mm -hmm. so pivotal in the scene as, as it is now? Because I think especially with this past weekend with the OVO Fest and everything, it was very much illustrated how big it is. Yeah, well, we already we had it in us already mm -hmm. and also they were we were slowly being heard down there but we didn't take over yet so i kind of already mm. knew we had the potential we had the talent um but drake took it to another level and it's not just drake there's so many other artists that have come you know from here since that time frame so i mean no i'm not surprised i mean we mm. we've been having flavor it's about time we got our juice it's about time we yeah got at us. and it's not just hip-hop it's not just r&b it's pop it's rock it's reggae music. It's everything. Mm -hmm. Toronto, it's the multicultural. It's a fusion. It doesn't even have to be a fusion of music. It's just there's a vibe here. Just like there's a vibe in New York. It's a different vibe, but yeah. it's a vibe, you know? So when we, we work it out, and if you can either love it or you don't love it, you know, sometimes I love it, sometimes I hate it. That's why I don't stay all the time. And then when right. I leave, I miss it. <laughs> when I leave, That's I miss it. it. You know, but yeah. there's no place in, in Canada like it. You can mm -hmm. you can try to replicate it. Uh, other cities are great, but Toronto has a vibe. So um, it's about time we got that respect. We deserve it. Yeah, we speak to yeah. a lot of artists, and uh, often we is you know we keep hearing like 
what are your what are your goals you know where do you want to go usually you know i grew up in the rock thing so it was always california la that kind right. of stuff and you hear people saying oh, no no i'm working to get to toronto and i was like wow yeah. <laughs> that's so amazing you know yeah. it's hard to even believe so how about your your you know we can see some of your personal artwork back there you have many different pieces that you showcase on your instagram as well uh curious how that came in for you and and how do you find the time to to make so much art i have to do stop like i have to stop do music do. and do art and then take a break okay or, yeah or i have to do it or i can't just keep working on music but that i was painting uh, had to get into college and i was going for radio and you had to do a backup so you had to do a portfolio and so i applied for art so i had some drawings and stuff but i had to show some diversity so i i did some paintings and wasn't very good at painting so it was a challenge and then I kind of put that down for a while. And then when I started doing a ceremony more and more, doing sweat lodge and other ceremonies, it just, I started painting more and more and more. And I was, you know, I was doing it regularly every week and with some powerful people. And it just started evolving and evolving and evolving to a thing where it integrated itself into part of my life like that, where I sometimes I'm like, wow, I'm paint, I'm, I'm doing more painting than, than music. I never would have expected that. So wow. I'm not, I didn't question it. I just kind of roll with it. And, you know, I'm thankful because that got me into doing, you know, I always love doing clothes and t-shirts. So another hobby I do is designing shirts, like, you know, back to the studio, nice. and <laughs> all I kinds of it. stuff. I like flipping logos and, you know, it was from point of trying to put my paintings on clothing because people were like, mm. Hey, that would look great on a shirt, but it's, you'd think it's easy, but it's not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> seriously. On a shirt, it's not that easy. It's so not going to print the same way. Right. I had to learn about that stuff. And, you know, so it was, it was good to, to learn new things. Right. So everything is an extension of something else. Right. Yeah. We also know you have your line of NFTs that you did. That was super, super successful. Of course, with Eric Sermon, you guys sold 291 NFTs in 24 hours. Yeah. And uh, that's insane. Well, yeah. It was pretty successful. I was back in the fall and I was able mm -hmm. to donate some money to uh indian residential school survivors society so that was a good thing and that was my whole point of doing the nfts was okay if we can use this to um to raise money for different projects or communities you know it would be a dope idea unfortunately right now the market's down so people are buying this but it's going to come back so i'm just being patient uh, yeah. before i do another drop because i do have another drop ready um <laughs> And yeah, it's, 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 it's a crazy new world. So I've really been getting into the NFT market and that space and try to explore what possibilities I can do for myself. Um, and I want to try something new, so we'll see what happens. That's awesome. Has it been a very lucrative thing or is it uh, like, do you feel like it's something that is, is going to continue to grow the NFT space? Oh, definitely. Everything's yeah. going to be an NFT eventually. It's just, you know, people got, people panicked. Some people, there was a crash. Yeah, people panicked. People are going to step back a bit because everybody was jumping on on the bandwagon, right? And that's what happens. So mm -hmm. now you know there's and it's crazy because you know stuff went down, but now's the time to really make money. So that's it. Yeah. Market's low. That's when you strike. So if you got money, I suggest you you know invest in some. You know we have a we launched a coin called uh, Gats Dollar Dollar Sign Piece Gorilla Arts Token. Uh, with mm -hmm. some, some uh, like-minded people. So look out for that. That's available um, in the NFT spaces on all the currency exchanges. So you can invest and buy that coin right now and use it for trading, use it for buying NFTs. Um, it's the first coin, NFT-based um, coin that is indigenous, um, as far as I know. I could be wrong, but it, the idea was... That's amazing. Was, uh, yeah, a lot of indigenous... Um, people I work with, we came together to, to launch something like this because we felt that it was needed. We could use it within our own communities. Um, we could, you know, make things with it. And also a lot of the people are artists. So we're, the collective is about doing the artwork as well as, you know, selling artwork, making the space, you know, who, who knows, perhaps we'll make a, um, perhaps we'll make a gallery with it, a, a Gats gallery. Um, you know, so stuff like that. So it's trying to grow the market and the spaces and educate people so that they don't lose money when there's a crash, so that they yeah. know how to handle their portfolios. 
And because a lot of people are jumping in and they might not be educated. So education is key. Just like we always say, safety first. That applies, to ed, you know, educate yourself before you, you know, you don't want to do harm mm -hmm. when you're trying to do good. You know, Just like, dive in blind, right? Yeah, don't. Yeah, do yeah. <laughs> especially in this space. FOMO, you know, they don't want a FOMO sure. as, as they say, right? The FOMO yeah. and getting in, uh, fear of missing out. Um, I'm just curious, like, uh, you know, you've done so much, such a vast uh, career and uh, in many different things. What would you tell like a, a younger David Stric Strickland? Like, what would you tell yourself? I was thinking about that today. I wouldn't believe uh, where I'd be at now. I, you know, I try to quit a million times. I would just say, don't quit. It's going to be okay. And just keep moving. You know, that's kind of my keep it moving. Things don't work out. I don't get mad no more. I just go, okay, it didn't work. Next. Next, yeah. <laughs> I, I can't. I just, a uh, couple of tears go, like, because why? Why? It's just wasting energy. Waste. Try to conserve. I guess as you get older, you try to conserve energy, you know? There you go. Because it's, I find even things get harder. Um, things will get harder for you, whether you're in good shape or not. You just, you know, it's nature, right? Yeah, no yeah, question like, about that. It's, it's living in the middle, I say. Like, it's, uh, you, you can be happy, be sad, but at the same time, like, stay in the middle because, like, life will always just throw you a curveball. So, so yeah. no matter how high you are, it'll, it'll humble you. Always something happening. So, like, it's, I can't even, mm. why bother? It's just, <laughs> These are the go facts. around. Go, <laughs> like, when I'm driving, I used to honk a lot. Now I just go around. Go around. That's I all it is. Around. Some people get mad at me when I do that, too. So, whatever. Uh, <laughs> you know, David, in closing, I just really wanted to ask, you know, for the spirit of hip hop elements, which is out on August 26th, what's something that you would maybe want to impart to folks who are listening that you'd want them to know before going into this album? Is there anything that people should know mentally going in? You know, I try to tell the stories from different perspectives. There's a couple different stories. There's, you know, it's not all serious. It's not all fun, but there's a couple serious songs and, yeah. uh, you know, just going with an open mind and, you know, I try to write a dope record and make you move and make you think and make you have fun and, and you know, showcase a lot of dope talent because a lot of people I work with are amazing and, and they, they have their own projects, but, you know, it's like, why not bring them into this? And there's a lot of people who are new. There's some new artists yeah. on here you might not have heard and, you know, they get their, their I don't want to say chance, but they're, there for a reason because they are dope. So yeah. you know, I'm grateful to all the artists who are involved. Shout out to them because I couldn't do a record without them, um, unless I just did an instrumental or, or I rap. But I'm not, <laughs> you know. Um, what's that? You know, once you've got that that mindset, just put it. I try to make it so when you put on the beginning, you would. And I, what I do is I do a thing where I call it living with my mixes. So. I'm nice. mixing a record and I, I'll live with it. So I'll, I'll mix four, five, six songs at a time. And then when I go home at night, I listen to it. I'm working, doing stuff, other things. I take it in. I oh. mentally note the changes. I change them. They evolve. And mm. so when I did this record, I try to make it so when I, I put it on and drive, you just go on a journey and just by the time it ends, you're like, damn, it's over. You know? Yeah. So <laughs> Already. That's, that's my perspective, how I want to listen to an album. You know, because a lot of people would just press play and skip. So yeah. I don't like the beat. Skip. No, just take it in. Go on the journey. That's how albums used to be. There mm -hmm. was a theme or there was, uh, you know, a, there was a journey involved. And I just want you to go on a musical journey and have a good time. Just have a good time. Try it's like Jay-Z. Do you listen to music or do you skim through it? Right. That's what he right. said. So right. these listen. are the facts. That's the message I want to get across. Listen. Just listen. Just give it a listen. It's interesting because, like, I always lately too, but working on my stuff, I, I I use the same expression as you. I live with it. I I, I have to sort of live with it mentally. It'll tell me right away. And I find one thing I do. I find I do my uh, most of my producing is literally on my bike or on a walk, listening to right. it. You know. Now so that's what now, I'm like. Yeah. Let yeah. me clarify something. You can do that now because of technology. Before mm -hmm. I'd have to recall the mix. And it, like I used to oh, mix right. in a big room with S to sell, and you got all these outboard gear plugged in and you have an assistance and they got to write things down and i've had <laughs> situations where i've had songs be recalled 20 30 times almost oh, wow you know by artists so you recalling takes two hours and sometimes yeah. it's not perfect and like You'll things move. were different back then so you went in and you mixed and that was it at the end of the day if you had time you'd recall now keep in mind studios like an hour hour 50 uh, sorry 100 150 an hour 
yeah. is adding yeah. up back. You know, some studios are more. So nowadays you have the luxury where you might not have to be in a studio or you're only in there less time. So you can live yeah. with it. Whereas before you kind of had to like live with whatever you had at the end of the day, right? It's Seriously. Ball game. Yeah. What you have yeah. was so what I you had. From that to this so I can appreciate that. And that's why I yeah. do that. And it's really made the mixes that much better because not to say we were rushing, time constraints and you don't always yeah. have time. You forget things. Not only that, the label comes back two days later. You uh -huh. can't just have a, you can't have the board just sitting there for two days. Yeah, right? it's not yeah. cheap either, right? No. Yeah. So, you know, keep that in mind. Yeah, it's true. Phenomenal tips, man. David, thank you so much for your time, my man. It's, it's been a pleasure and I love what I've been hearing on the album. Thank you. Thanks for having yeah. me. And uh, you guys have a great day. And everybody out there, go buy the album or at least go listen to the album. Give it a shot. Take it in. Tell somebody. And, you know, make some great music. And listen. <laughs> hey, destination, six nations. Got the homie Vic waiting with some inspiration. Now that's an E.T. homecoming. Big smoke, big love, the only way to run it. We're the fam, we're the grub, let me call the cousins. Shout out to my baby, with our baby in the oven. Huge shout out to David Strickland for joining us on this brand new episode of Inner Sleeve. You know, Joe, I have to say, David, just definitely a no-nonsense guy, but also a guy who, he knows his stuff. You know, I, I feel like he's... Uh, there's not much you can get past a guy like this when he's who's a veteran like this in the business. Yeah, and I love the fact that, like, see, last week we had Bo Deans, who was, uh, you know, a, a proponent of the analog way and, like, more of the analog way, less of the digital. And him is like, no, give me everything. Like, I love it. I love what we can do today. I love all the tools. Unfortunately, and it's true, I feel the same way. Like, you just don't, you're not 16. You don't have all day to play with them and, and experiment with them. So you just got to move, move, move and do it, you know? Another thing was cool. It's true that we said, like, because uh, I, I, you know, in parallel with what I'm experiencing is I'll go on my walks and produce, listen to stuff in my headphones and, and I'll make more decisions there than in the studio sometimes, you know, or, or like, mm -hmm. or final decisions. But it's true what he said. Like, you can't just, you know, back in the day, they would leave the thing set up, wait to hear back from the label, lower the vocal or raise the vocal or whatever. Then you would do your touch-ups especially back in the day where we would have to do a recall. So a recall means you got to put everything back, the EQs exactly like they were. How much were you sending to that reverb? And when these boards, like you're never going to get the exact, Takes forever. exact amount, especially if it was like a, a performance mix. What I mean by that is like, there's sometimes where you need all hands on deck. Literally. I've done a few of these where it's like, all right, when the second verse comes in, you're going to throw the delay. And then so you can have a, Hey, 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 hey echo only on that one spot, you know, and stuff. like that. so you have to perform that mix. If someone screws up, you got to start again. You know, so imagine when wow. like, you know, if if you can't have a studio just sitting there waiting for someone to say, yeah, OK, that's fine. The mix. Now we can move, unplug everything, you know, whereas today everything's in the box for the most part. So much easier. Just open your session and in, in, in 20 seconds, you're back to where you were as opposed to hours. Of, <laughs> and you wouldn't get it exactly because it's impossible to get it exactly. Too many variables, you know. And even now, it's hard to, to, you know, make the exact same presets, even when it's all digital and stuff as well. Right. Yeah, stuff sounds well. You know, technically it's saved and stuff, but there's always something, right? There's always that's like, it. Something when you that's transfer different. systems, and I mean, it's it's yeah. just a whole whole thing. But I mean, it was really cool to hear from someone who's who's been in the business, like you're saying, you know, from Bodine's to David, from mm -hmm. the beginning in one way, and then you know, rode through it. And the adaptability, I think, is something that I, we see is very important for all artists. I think of all different stages of the game as well, Joe. Yeah, and like you know, this is someone who's now looking to give back and that's what is this whole like mission his purpose right now it seems to be uh yeah i know when a gig comes i'll do it and whatever but like his whole thing now seems to be giving back and getting that getting these things settled and more represented and stuff uh, for the first community you know 100 percent, and he's doing a phenomenal job at that we thank david strickland for joining us on this episode and make sure to hit the link in the description below for all of his latest socials and of course his brand new project we have all the info you need down below also make sure to subscribe to us right here at sound mojo we're on youtube every single day there's brand new content so make sure to hit that subscribe button as well as that like and leave us a comment letting us know what your favorite part of today's show was and of course on the community tab we'll be back with our reactions to you guys' suggestions once again next week also don't forget to check out the sound mojo merchandise store the link is down below from t-shirts crewnecks hoodies phone cases what don't we have joe hmm. 
Porsches. <laughs> Porsches. Okay, yeah. Well, those are coming in stock soon. Yeah. Uh, check out the sound, the sound Mojo merch. And of course, make sure to follow us on all of our social media as well. TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Sound Mojo. We'll give you guys a response to your comment and probably follow you back. Thanks so much for tuning into this brand new episode of Inner Sleeve. We'll catch you guys next week.